Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorers 2022 Halloween Special. We're going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of the Southern Cotswolds to visit some of the more ghoulish and spooky places. Marauding crusaders, phantom ships, flying monks. We'll find them all. Come with us if you dare. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you want to hear more spooky stories from me, check out the link in the description. In 2021, we took you on a ghostly trail of the central Cotswolds. We visited some of the most haunted places the region has to offer, from phantom monks and moving stones all the way to wailing ghouls and demonic chariots. This year, we start in the sprawling settlements of Cheltenham and Gloucester, and then we move into the depths of the Cotswold Hills to the villages of Minchinhampton, Tetbury, and Malmesbury. We visit the capital of the Cotswolds itself, Sirencester, before moving east to my home village of Bampton again. So come with us, if you dare. Those of you who watched our previous Halloween special will know that last time we began our trail in Prestbury, the most haunted village in the whole country. This time, we're starting only a couple of miles away in the grand old town of Cheltenham. On the western edge of the Cotswolds, Cheltenham is as ancient as any other town in the county. As a royal manor, it features in the earliest pages of the Gloucestershire section of the Doomsday Book and was awarded a market charter in 1226. We use this town as a starting point for one main reason. It is home, to quote the author Joseph Braddock, to the best accredited ghost story on record. This famous phantom has become known among the paranormal community simply as the Cheltenham Ghost. The apparition haunts a Georgian townhouse called Garden Reach on Pitville Circus Road. This most famous ghost of all was officially investigated by the Society for Psychical Research. Frederick Myers, who was the honorary secretary of the society, interviewed a number of first-hand witnesses. Many people had claimed to have seen it over the years and contemporaneous records were taken on many occasions, in particular by a member of the family that lived in the house. The hauntings occurred between 1882 and 1886, just 20 years after the house was built. Garden Reach's first residents were an unhappy couple called Swinhoe. Mr. Swinhoe had taken to drink apparently never able to get over the death of his first wife. His second wife, Imogen, was very poorly treated as a result and subsequently, or should I say consequently, she hit the bottle too. After years of booze and argument, they finally succumbed, together perhaps for the first time, to the alcohol. The next family to move in were the Despards. Captain Despard and his wife never experienced anything particularly ghostly, beyond inexplicable noises and the sound of feet apparently traipsing the passages and stairs. However, their servants, children and guests all claimed to see the ghost. Perhaps the most articulate witness was their 19-year-old daughter Rose. Her account of her first sighting of the ghost is recorded as follows. I had gone up to my room, but was not yet in bed, when I heard someone at the door, and went to it, thinking it might be my mother. On opening the door, I saw no one, but on going a few steps along the passage, I saw the figure of a tall lady, dressed in black, standing at the head of the stairs. 
After a few moments she descended the stairs, and I followed for a short distance, feeling curious who it could be. I had only a small piece of candle, and it suddenly burned itself out. Being unable to see any more, I went back to my room. The figure was a tall lady dressed in black, of a soft woolen material judging from the slight sound when she moved. Her face was hidden by a handkerchief held in the right hand. This is all I noticed then, but on further occasions when I was able to observe her more closely, I saw the upper part of the left side of her forehead and a little of the hair above. Her left hand was nearly hidden by her sleeve and a fold of her dress, but as she held it down a portion of a widow's cuff was visible on both wrists, so that the whole impression was that of a lady in widow's weeds. During the two years from 1882 to 1884, she claimed to see the figure about a dozen times, initially with long intervals that gradually grew shorter with each appearance. On one occasion, Rose approached the phantom and attempted to speak to it. Rose was convinced it was attempting to reply, but all she heard was a sigh, and the ghost sidestepped her and disappeared into the darkness. On other occasions, the family heard mysterious footsteps, bangs, bumps, and the turning of door handles by invisible hands. In 1948, years after the Despards had left, a full review of the case was published by psychical researcher B. Abdi Collins. Garden Reach had become a boarding school for boys in the 1900s, but was forced to move because of the regular appearance of the ghost. Shortly after this, the building was converted into flats, renamed St Anne's, since when no further reports of ghostly activity have ever been reported. Of course, this isn't the only haunted place in Cheltenham. In the general hospital, a grey lady, looking like an old-fashioned nurse, has been encountered on a number of occasions. She was reported as wearing a shroud, looking very pale and ghastly, suddenly appearing outside the door to the mortuary. This was witnessed first by a terrified employee who ran away in panic. She never saw the apparition again, but many others did. Ross Andrews' website, Paranormal Cheltenham, tells the tale of a haunted house in Montpellier Terrace where ghostly voices, footsteps and inexplicable noises could be heard. This was all just a trailer to the sudden appearance of shadowy, toad-like creatures emerging from under a bed and crawling straight through the skirting board as if it were not there. There have been many more ghostly sightings in this town, including a man sporting a World War II gas mask and shadowy figures on the balcony at the Playhouse Theatre. Cheltenham is a beautiful town and well worth a visit, whether or not you're interested in or believe in these spooky tales. The neighbouring city of Gloucester also boasts a variety of ghostly tales. We had the pleasure of visiting Gloucester Cathedral in our Easter special, and that is where we're heading next. The cathedral, built shortly after the Norman Conquest, provides many reasons for you to visit. The breathtaking medieval cloister, the huge east window, and of course the burial place of Edward II. But this story involves the highly decorated Victorian organ. This first-hand account is by Miss Agnes Weston. Dating from the late 19th century, she practiced on the instrument for five hours every single day, and as a result was often in the cathedral after dark. One evening, her tutor was called away, and because of regulations, she had to be temporarily locked inside the building. Now, Miss Weston did not believe in ghosts, but she was aware of a legend that under the organ loft, a medieval crusader was buried. It was said that he would walk down the nave after dark, 
his mailed feet and spurs echoing all round the church. He'd head to the west end of the cathedral before returning up one of the side aisles where his footsteps would stop just when they reached his grave. Shortly after her tutor left her, this is exactly what Miss Weston heard. The organ blower emerged from his position in the heart of the organ loft, white and trembling, for he had heard it too. They both listened as the footsteps faded, then returned from the west end of the building. They came nearer and nearer, pausing at the foot of the organ loft stairs. Miss Weston said later, I must say that I felt my flesh creep, and I was sure that something supernatural was happening, but I crushed my fears, and lantern in hand, ran down the stairs to see. Absolutely nothing. Another story tells of a 14-year-old apprentice who fell to his death from the scaffolding during the construction of the cathedral. His troublesome spirit lurked around the site until a ceremony of exorcism was held, which supposedly eased his passage to the afterlife. Counterintuitively, the method used seems to have been to coax his spirit into a leather bottle and then to bury it in one of the cathedral's pillars. His spirit, perhaps not surprisingly, was never to cause a nuisance again. The author of Paranormal Gloucester, Lynn Sindley, also tells of a first-hand account of a creepy encounter in Gloucester Cathedral. A Mr. David Leach recounted how, as a young boy, he was helping catalogue books in the cathedral library. He was on his own when he heard a deep, disembodied voice in his ear. When are you going to leave? the voice demanded. Mr. Leach thought he'd imagined the voice, but a few seconds later it was repeated, sounding angrier. Mr. Leach was not going to argue with the ghost, and so hurried out of the room. He was later informed that the library had been created in a space formerly used as a mortuary for medieval monks. Leaving the cathedral, we head down to the Gloucester Docks. These Gloucester Docks are a recently restored tourist hotspot with plenty of history. There are tales of ghost ships in these docks. One is said to take the form of a Spanish bark in which a terrible murder took place when it was moored here, just here, some two centuries ago. As dawn rose around the old dock, two Spanish sailors were spotted, hanging upside down from the yard arm. Their throats had been slit and their blood had soaked into the deck below during the night. Their killers were never caught, though it was believed the men were murdered by fellow Spaniards from a rival trading vessel. Another story tells of a sailor who was walking along the dockside one night when he noticed an incredibly dilapidated old ship tied up alongside the quay. A dim light came from one of the portholes. His curiosity getting the better of him, he decided to investigate. Climbing aboard, he found his way to the cabin where he'd seen the light, only to be driven away by a strange, angry man wearing a mustard-coloured coat and cap, apparently floating feet above the ground. The terrified sailor ran for his life. When he returned to his shipmates and recounted the tale, they asked him, what ship? He looked out to the dock, and sure enough, there was no ship to be seen. Nor had there been, they said, the entire time they were in port. There are many other haunted places in Gloucester. The Greyfriars Inn on Southgate Street is home to a troublesome poltergeist. And at an old school in Archdeacon Street, the ghost of a teacher haunts the place, apparently expressing her unhappiness about alterations made to the school. We hear they called in a medium. The spirit was placated, and the haunting has stopped. We're told that Gloucester has a handful of haunted pubs, as well as a haunted prison. So do come and discover more for yourself. We are moving south, heading for the village of Minchinhampton. 
we're heading for the Ragged Cot Inn. This pub was built in the 17th century as a coaching inn and to this day makes for a wonderful place to stay and to eat. Their ghost hails from 1760 when the Ragged Cot's landlord, Bill Clevers, had just had his first child. He was not a rich man, and with the new mouth to feed, he badly needed a cash injection of some kind. And he decided he would rob the stagecoach, which passed by the inn at around midnight. He took some rum to steady his nerves, loaded up two pistols, and staggered outside in the direction of the stagecoach. On his way out, his wife, child in arms, tried to dissuade him from his crazy plan, but he pushed her aside, causing her to fall down the stairs. He stepped over the two prone bodies of his wife and child, and armed and masked, walked out into the darkness, where he successfully robbed the coach. He arrived back at the inn, sobering up fast, where, to his horror, he found his wife and child lying at the bottom of the stairs, stone dead. Not only was he now a robber, he was a murderer too. Meanwhile, the local constables, tracking Claver's footsteps through the snow from the scene of the robbery, sent some commotion within the Ragged Cot pub. And as the constables prepared to force an entry at the front door, they heard a shriek of terror from within. Forcing open the door, they found Bill Claver's a gibbering wreck, the bodies of his wife and child dead at his feet. They managed to wrangle a confession out of the broken man. Clavers told them he had dragged the bodies down to the cellar where he had tried to hide them in a trunk. He said that the ghosts of his wife and child had appeared to him whilst he had attempted to conceal their corpses and made him carry them back upstairs. He was taken away, tried for murder, found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. Following the tragedy, eerie crying noises have often been heard from the cellar and the ghost of Mrs. Clever, her baby in her arms, has been spotted on the stairs many times by guests staying at the inn. There have been sightings of ghostly horsemen and a phantom hound around the roads of Minchinampton. And the long stone just past Hollybush Farm has strong supernatural associations. We'll go and have a look. This enormous rock is alleged to move around the field in which it stands, always at midnight, and occasionally it wanders to the nearby spring in Minchinhampton to have a drink. It's also said to hold certain mystical properties. Mothers treated their children for smallpox or rickets by passing them through the gap in the stone. Legend also says that the rock contains pure gold, but that it's guarded by a ferocious ghost, perhaps a large spectral dog or wolf of some kind. We now leave Minchinhampton and head further south to Malmesbury. But on the way, we'll drop in on Tetbury to hear a couple more tragic ghostly tales. We've spoken before of the wonderful Chavenage House and the legend of a headless King Charles I arriving to collect the body of Colonel Nathaniel Stevens. Stevens was involved in the decision to execute the King. Now, at regular intervals, a coach with four black horses driven by the headless king, arrives at the house in complete silence. As it draws up to the house, Stephen's ghost enters the vehicle and it leaves Chavenage, bursting into flames as it reaches the end of the drive. But there's another sad tale from the Civil War, a tragic story of love found and lost. Chavenage House was in the hands of the parliamentarians under Colonel Massey, who gave orders to attack the nearby royalist stronghold of Beverstone Castle, just down the road. After a couple of attacks failed on the castle, 
and it had become clear that royalists had known they were coming, Massey became suspicious. He discovered that a maid from Chavenage House was secretly signalling to her lover, Commander Oglethrope, of the Beveston garrison. She had been placing a candle in a small window to show him all was well and that no attacks were planned from Chavenage on that night, and that it was safe for him to visit her. The maid was seized and held prisoner at Chavenage. A candle was placed in the window to trick Oglethrope. He made his way to Chavenage under the cloak of darkness to meet his young girl. He was ambushed and the Beverstone stronghold was attacked. After a brief siege, the castle fell and Oglethrope's bloodied body was hung from the ramparts as a grisly warning. When the young girl was told what had happened, she took her own life. Her ghost, now known as the White Lady, has been seen wandering the fields between Chavenage and Beverston, desperately trying to warn her lover not to approach. There are even more ghostly tales here at Chavenage. Stories of discomfort and claustrophobia in the room where Oliver Cromwell spent the night, as well as phantom monks in the nearby chapel. But for now, however, we're heading southeast towards Malmesbury. As we have discussed many times on this channel, Henry VIII's Reformation saw the destruction of many religious buildings, particularly around the Cotswolds. And it's difficult to imagine that Malmesbury Abbey, amazing as it is now, would have been far larger and grander before the Reformation. This abbey was spared complete destruction and what's left was retained as the parish church. The ghost of a Benedictine monk has been spotted wandering the cemetery and the sound of chanting has been heard coming from within the monastery walls after dark. One tale tells of a young monk called Elmer who lived at the abbey and had become obsessed with the idea of flying. Having heard of the fabled flight of Icarus, he too set about the task of making some wings to take him to the sky. One day, his wings complete, he climbed to the top of one of the abbey's towers and jumped off. Not surprisingly, a large group of curious onlookers watched from below. He succeeded in flying a remarkable distance before crashing to the ground, breaking his legs. Undeterred by his injuries, he worked to perfect his wing designs, but when the news reached the bishop, he was banned from attempting any further flights. A hooded monk has been seen many times around the grounds. From time to time he reportedly pauses, then raises his arms skyward in a kind of eureka gesture. Could it be that this apparition is in fact Elmer, joyful at seeing mankind finally take to the skies? That'd be fun. Next door to the Abbey is the oldest hotel in Britain, the Old Bell. The foundations date back to 1220. It's no surprise, therefore, that this place has some spooky stories. It's believed that the east wing of the hotel was constructed on part of the Abbey churchyard, and there may be several sarcophagi concealed beneath the hotel bar. Phantoms are the order of the day. One of the most commonly spotted phantoms is another grey lady. She's been seen in the James Odie room by staff and residents alike, described as looking melancholy and sad as she glides around the room. I hear tell that if the words grey lady are spoken out loud three times within that room, then she will appear. Guests have reported having their belongings thrown across the room by an invisible force, and night staff have reported hearing unexplained sounds and feeling cold shivers during their shifts. Now we travel north to the ancient Roman town of Sarancester, the titular capital of the Cotswolds. Right in the centre, the King's Head pub is home to a resident ghost. 
it's possible that this pub stands roughly on the spot of what was a Roman staging post when Cirencester thrived as the second largest town in the country. Its most famous ghost is that of a shadowy monk, apparently with no face. He's most commonly seen on the stairs, and one staff member's encounter with him led to her quitting her job rather than face the possibility of seeing him again. It's also home to a ghostly cavalier. It is thought he was a casualty of a skirmish that took place in 1688 between supporters of William of Orange and those of the Stuarts. The man, called Whitelock, was hit by a musket ball and later died in a room in the hotel. The room was named the Whitelock Suite in his honour. On one occasion, a terrified employee looked up from his work to see the phantom cavalier pointing a pistol at his head. Strange noises, hurled objects, and a mysterious fireball have also been reported in the room, and a terrified wailing has been heard echoing throughout the place. Not far away, just past the church, are the old abbey grounds. There are several reports of an old gentleman dressed in Victorian clothes, walking towards the river after dark, and inevitably a phantom monk has been spotted in the area. Now we move further east. We've now arrived at our penultimate destination on this ghost tour, my home village of Bampton. There is a chilling tale of an exorcism at Bampton Manor House, an imposing 18th century building that was built on the site of an earlier farmhouse. The residents of the house were troubled by a shadowy poltergeist and so they enlisted professional help from a religious figure to perform an exorcism. It was common practice to summon the restless spirit in question and then trap it in some kind of vessel. Some of you may remember the story of the Tanfields in Burford who were coaxed into a bottle and buried in the river Windrush after their flaming chariot terrorised the town. They threatened to reappear when the river ran particularly dry. Something to think about in 2022, during the driest summer in living memory. Here, however, the unusual container used to trap the spirit was a barrel of beer. Rather than dispose of the barrel, the family chose to keep it below the house in the cellar, where it apparently stayed for donkey's years. As the location of the barrel has now been lost to the mists of time, somewhere a troublesome spirit could be awaiting its release. Perhaps this place is in danger of being overrun with spirits. There is another legend surrounding the church in Bampton behind me. If you want to know who in the village is going to die in the next year, it's possible to find out by coming here to St Mary's Church at midnight on October the 31st. If you wait by the church's west doorway, you will witness a procession of all the elderly and sick people in the village slowly making their way into the church, apparently vanishing through the closed door. Not long after, they will re-emerge from the church, only this time only those that would survive the next 12 months will reappear. If you are unlucky enough to see your loved ones enter the church, but fail to reappear, you will know their time on earth is coming to an end. Hmm. I think I'll make arrangements to be on holiday that week. For our final tale, we journey a few miles north to the ancient market town of Whitney. Not quite in the area of outstanding natural beauty, but with an interesting story to tell, nonetheless. Since as far back as the 11th century, every year a large procession celebrated the Easter religious holiday, moving through the town and across the river Windrush. Various effigies and puppets representing biblical figures were carried aloft, 
and a great time was had by one and all. However, what started as a religious ceremony organized by the church soon became more of a rowdy celebration. It attracted more and more people who attended the event more to drink and make merry than to celebrate the rebirth of Christ. And as a result, the church decided to ban the procession. This did not go down well with the locals, who looked forward to the processions each year. The following Easter, a drunken mob formed in the town and threatened to destroy the bridge over the Windrush if the church did not lift their ban. It seems a young and inexperienced priest confronted the mob, attempting to stop the rabble from any precipitous action. The mob saw this as the church digging its heels in, and the novice priest was flung from the bridge, where he drowned in the rushing waters of the river. Legend has it that if you go to the bridge on the third evening after Easter and look down into the water, you will see a phantom drowned cleric floating face down in the water as it passes beneath the bridge. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of tonight's ghost stories in the Cotswolds. All the way from Cheltenham and Gloucester in the south, We've covered everything from ghostly crusaders to phantom boats, poltergeists in pubs, and myths of Neolithic stones. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more exploration of the Cotswolds, and follow us on Instagram. If you enjoy ghost stories, be sure to check out our other newly minted YouTube channel dedicated solely to exploring haunted places and horrific tales up and down the country. The link is below. Other guidebooks are also available, so you can follow the ghostly trails yourselves by visiting the link in the description. Available in paperback, Kindle, and of course, audiobook. Happy Halloween and safe travels. In the middle of the night, he felt a pain in his shoulder, came broad awake and saw the gleaming eyes and grinning teeth of some animal close to his face. Its claws were in his shoulder and its mouth in the act of seeking his throat. From within came the sounds of a mingled moaning and growling. Having reached the top, he ran at full speed for some distance across the moor before venturing to look behind him. The extraordinary weight of the picture had struck me too. I was about to reply when I caught sight of my own hand. There was blood on it in considerable quantities, covering the whole palm. I've cut myself somehow, said I. Then a voice already familiar to me, spoke. I knew you would come to the room in the tower, it said. I've been long waiting for you. At last you've come. Tonight I shall feast. Before long we will feast together.